Good morning, everybody. I would never have predicted that I would end up as an attorney general with that kind of introduction. So thank you, Cindy. And I say that by way of acknowledging some of my foray into becoming a lawyer and running for office had a lot more to do with watching Perry Mason probably than getting involved in energy issues. In fact, um, when people started to first suggest to me that I might want to run for attorney general, I said, what? I'd have to do utility rate regulation. Why would I want to do that? Um, having said that, I realize in the last five years um, that there are a bunch of issues for which it is incredibly important that the attorney general um, provide leadership, transparency, uh, a way to connect dots. And that's been true for us in healthcare. Uh, a big cost driver for businesses. It's also true for us in energy, which as you know is a very big cost driver uh, for businesses and for uh, other consumers here in Massachusetts. And as I see it as our role to try and um, be the honest broker or to provide leadership uh, in getting at the facts, for instance, in order to devise an appropriate policy, uh, I've used the same a uh, process that we use in other areas as we have with energy, which is um, get people who know what they're doing, uh, who understand this, um, and dig in and try and figure out with the stakeholders uh, where we should be going. And when we've done that, not just in energy, but in other areas too, I've found that actually um, there are fewer differences than you would think. Uh, there's more ability for people to come to the table on the merits of issues. And that's been particularly true in the energy field, although I still think that for Massachusetts and for New England and for the country, um, there are a couple of things that still need some work. We don't have an overreaching policy, and it's been difficult to do that. And we don't have as much transparency as we should have around um, the energy field. And there's some good reasons for that. I'm not saying that it's anybody's fault that that's the case. But it's going to take a little bit of work because until we can make this less opaque and until we can get more policy based on data, uh, based on at least uh, an understanding from people who uh, work in the field and who understand it, we're still, I think, going to be frustrated and working around the edges uh, of what is an increasingly important issue, um, not just for the economy, but for our safety, for our security. And so it continues to be a big challenge. And as part of my duties recently, I had an opportunity to go to a conference of Western Attorneys General uh, meeting on energy. And I thought, well, I'm not sure what I will bring to this from New England, and I'm not sure how much those issues will affect us since everything out west is bigger and different. But the interesting thing I took away from that conference, and we dealt with everything from why are gas prices at the pump so high to what do we do about fracking to what do we do about global markets, um, that there are many fewer differences than you would think with the people who are concerned about the environment and people who are concerned about energy costs and people in the field. And the one lament that I heard time and time again, and this was from government people, from policy people, from environmentalists, um, from businessmen and women, is that we don't seem to be able to even start the discussion on the policy, uh, and as a result of which, um, we go forward in fits and starts and in ways that aren't probably in the best interest of what everybody would like. So that, that to me was a little bit um, of a revelation, that I came away thinking there are ways that when we start to work together to talk about what the real issues are as opposed to taking adversarial positions or taking hardened positions, um, that we can and must, frankly, uh, do a lot better. And where's a better place to start than in Massachusetts? We have uh, a lot of knowledgeable people around the table uh, in not-for-profits, as your organization uh, is taken upon itself, in the industry, uh, in government and policy, uh, and what better way to start to tackle it than uh, right here this morning today with this conference that you're doing. So I'm delighted to be here um, and wanted to share with you some of the things uh, that we are doing. I know you're going to hear from Jesse Reyes, who's one of the folks uh, in our office as our division chief, uh, who does know the nuts and bolts from the bottom up, uh, and who I think has worked with Jed Nozel, who's our bureau chief, and many others in our office as well as you, to start to try and push forward on how can we do better on both of these things. Um, getting better information, making it more transparent, getting more consumers engaged in where this market is and should be going, um, and thereby, I think, being able to direct better policy. Um, in the first 
a uh, year in which I served as Attorney General. Uh, we had a New England regional conference based on environmental issues. And it's fair to say that attorneys general come to this office across the country with different backgrounds and focus and interests. Uh, many of them, like me, may come from a criminal justice background as opposed to a healthcare or civil or other background. But the one thing we found when we brought together our New England AGs, many of whom had different backgrounds, is that the people in our offices who'd been working on these issues were able to work together to say it's not just a Massachusetts issue, um, but it's a regional issue uh, with what's coming over into New Hampshire, for instance, from Ohio. What about the air pollution issues? And how do we start to tackle those things? Much easier said than done, but if we don't begin to identify them and work together, we're never going to get success on that. So as you all know, we are by statute the ratepayer advocate. Um, we advocate at the state and the federal level. As Cindy said in her introduction, um, we get to uh, play at different levels as we advocate before the DPU. Uh, we have had a particular focus in Massachusetts on making sure that rates and rate increases uh, are justified. Um, many of you probably remember that we with New York um, took a look at some of the uh, expenses that National Grid was looking at when they were seeking a rate increase and found there were certain categories, maybe like shipping wine from London that shouldn't be passed along to consumers. Um, that's uh, not always what we find, but we find when we do our homework and we look at that and we call, hold utilities um, to uh, their responsibility to ask for justified rate increases that they can back up and which are appropriate, um, then we are doing our job. We have, as Cindy said, saved ratepayers over $600 million um, in the last several years. We also advocated the federal level before the Federal Energy uh, Regulatory Commission on the wholesale energy markets to make sure they're competitive and to make sure uh, that the uh, investments are appropriate on the transmission side. And on the regional level, as Cindy mentioned, we've become very active with NEPOL in making sure um, that we and other consumers are able to come to the table and have a voice. Um, I was thinking this morning, it's not exactly Occupy ISO uh, that we're working on, um, but I think that it's important um, that we all uh, be able to have a voice and a say in what is happening at all levels uh, as we move forward on that. You're gonna get a better result. Uh, we're the first Attorney General's office in the history of the Commonwealth to have a voting seat um, at NEPOL, and that's a big difference. We've also been active in starting our consumer liaison group, uh, which has brought many of you to the table to get educated and have the discussions as you are today about end users and costs and what we can do um, to keep them uh, down or to keep them at least reasonable. Uh, and if you're not aware and you're interested, our next meeting is June 6th. I didn't tell Cindy I was gonna do a little ad for our um, uh, consumer liaison group, but our next meeting is June 6th at the Doubletree uh, at the Hilton in Westboro, and if you haven't been before and you're interested, uh, check with Jesse or check, uh, I know Ed Golds, where, Ed, where are you? Ed Goldstein is here from our Business Technology Economic Development Office. Um, they can give you the information on that or check our website. And as I mentioned, we've become active both in our regional uh, work as an attorney general as well as with the national group, uh, and I've found having um, as I've talked with my Democratic and Republican colleagues as attorneys general across the country and they become more engaged in these energy issues, we are in a unique position as attorneys general uh, to work with you in our states but also to try and connect some of these dots and work better on a policy uh, around where we should be going. Um, there are op opportunities ahead, I think, as you have realized through your organization, uh, but for all of us to have a better say about how much we pay for energy, uh, and how much we use, frankly. Uh, and so as we want to get more active in the rate setting process and energy policy making, that means having a voice with the legislature. It means um, uh, being active in front of the State Public Utility Commission with ISO New England. Uh, and all of those groups, of course, are making significant decisions um, on an annual basis um, that have a huge impact. Uh, intended and otherwise on where um, energy is going. So we should be, we, when I say we, I mean all of us should be at the table. And I do applaud the work that you have done together uh, to have an influence uh, in that advocacy. Um, let me talk briefly about the Green Communities Act. Um, we played a key role, I think, uh, in energy and in looking at uh, the green communities issues. And I am 
it's supportive of that legislation. I have said that. I supported it at the time. I support it now. Um, we uh, believe that uh, it is always a good idea to um, not just um, set things in motion, but to evaluate them and to keep an eye on how it's working. What are uh, the, is it reaching its goals? What are some of the unintended consequences of what's happening? Um, and so we have continued to, uh, as we've seen the implementation of the Green Communities Act, stay very much involved in, in many of the great uh, uh, work that it is accomplishing, uh, as well as um, what are some of the questions that I think we should be asking uh, around moving forward as economy has changed, for instance, or uh, lack of federal investment has changed. Uh, we always, I think, and that's not just the Green Communities Act, it's true on our health care policy, it's true on many of the things that we do. Uh, we think that it's important to uh, watch it as a dynamic process and then be able to say, is it working? How well is it working? Can it be working better? And over the next four years, um, we have looked at some of the costs that we believe are engaging, that we will be engaging in implementing that. Uh, we have suggested on the one hand, um, there is a big investment of uh, $4 billion uh, for implementing the Green Communities Act for renewable and energy efficiency. Uh, we know that those uh, programs also claim that there will be potential to save customer more than two times that amount, up to $9 billion over the next 10 years uh, and beyond. But one of the issues always is how good is that data, both obviously on the investment side and on the return side. And another issue obviously is whose investment is that? Uh, this is, as a ratepayer advocate, it is our job to also look at where is that investment coming from and who gets the return on that and how are we going to be able to track that to say that this was worth this or it wasn't. And these are all questions that we are raising um, to, I think, focus on uh, this very important legislation and the goals that it has set, again, that we agree with, but to make sure that we are maximizing what we need to as we move forward um, with this legislation. And so in We've made some recommended changes. Uh, we stood with the uh, Senate President and Senator Ben Downing, who's also from Berkshire County, where I hail from. Um, the three particular changes that we have talked about in terms of the Green Communities Act uh, are first that it be amended to ensure that we procure long-term renewable contracts through competitive processes. Uh, I think that that uh, is sort of a basic tenet to make sure that we're all seeing what's available and to introduce competition into this. The second proposal is that we have um, proposed eliminating overly generous sweetheart incentives that pay our utilities to manage the programs. Um, I think that's doable. I think we've learned a few things in the last few years around that, um, and we believe that's a reasonable proposal. We've also advocated that renewable development should be done on a technology-neutral basis absent some compelling need to ensure investment in a particular technology. And we don't rule that out, but I think this is where data uh, and study is important so that we don't uh, pick winners and losers without understanding um, the cost benefit for that, particularly for ratepayers. And so uh, those are the three principles that we have proposed as we look at moving forward with this important bill. And uh, as I say, I think that this is a dynamic process, not a static one particularly in this field, as I think it is in healthcare, um, that we want to um, let a market move forward. Massachusetts has been a leader in innovation technology around this. We hope that will continue. Uh, so you never want to have government too much in the way. I'm a firm believer in that, and that's why I depend upon uh, people to say we should be involved or we shouldn't be involved, and we may not always agree on the level of that, but we want to have that dialogue. So let's talk about transparency and how important that is in this whole process. I know your first panel is gonna be um, figuring out what that bill means. There, is, there are very few things that are less transparent than the energy field, and I talk to consumers a lot about uh, their bills and what it means, uh, and as we are pushing again, and I'm making these comparisons because there are a lot in the healthcare field, uh, for a long time, you know, people have gotten health care, someone else has paid for it, they haven't really understood. But as consumers now have more in the game, higher deductibles, um, more uh, uh, opportunity to pick tiered products, for instance, consumers need to be educated, basic tenet. The same thing is true in this field, that the more we know about how this works, the better we can advocate for ratepayers, but also for policy going forward. 
and so residential and consumer bills. Um, it's pretty hard for people to figure out really what they're about, and uh, I guess maybe some of you in the room know what your bills mean or pay attention to them, but even if you do, um, you may not have the key or the tools to how to change them or to make them more effective. So those are issues that we are committed to bringing to uh, moving forward transparency for bills and education for consumers around their energy costs and how they can be more cost effective in when, as I mentioned earlier, when they use energy and then how much they're going to pay for it. One of the things we're working on with DOER and the DPU is to establish a universal method of tracking utility bill rates so that we can break them down and we can also keep track of them going forward. Our goal is to develop a single method to track and evaluate electricity rates and charges and then make this data available to the public in a friendly format so that people do understand it and if they want to, they can get more educated. Uh, I think that this is an organization that can help us with that, and I think that if we begin to develop that baseline data that will allow us and other consumers to agree on the language we are talking about, it will be easier, I think, to then look at policy moving forward and where we can best accomplish cost-effective changes, um, not just to the Green Communities Act, but to other areas in Massachusetts where we want to move forward. And we think that that is true for the state, and we think it's true for individual consumers, we think it's true for businesses also. Um, I do think that uh, it is uh, a, a challenge and an opportunity at this time. Uh, I think the economy uh, is still uh, tough for everybody, we know that, but it's that's the time when people are willing to take a hard look at what their costs are and where we're going with that, so we should take advantage of that opportunity. That is true, obviously, in healthcare, it's true as we're looking at um, mortgages and the mortgage foreclosure. Uh, but if we have in mind the idea that uh, we can make this system less opaque and fairer, and you have some control on that, and obviously I'm preaching to the converted this morning because you're not only a member of Power Options, you're here this morning. Um, I think there's a whole lot of opportunity, um, even at the state level, to begin to develop policies that make sense and an ability to move forward um, hoping with technology innovations um, that we will, in 10 years or 20 years, be looking at both more transparency and a more coherent policy about how we move forward. Um, I'm delighted to be here today, and Sydney, I'd be happy to take questions or comments. And if you ask me a question I can't answer, I've got Jesse. So, <laughs> thank you. It always takes at least seven seconds for someone to either. Yes. Under the Green Communities Act, the, for instance, uh, as Cape Wind was moving forward, National Grid was able to purchase that power. Uh, that's one example that uh, I think we think looking forward, we should have bids and more competition for um, these projects. In other words, the goal is great to get the energy efficiency in place, uh, but it's related to the idea that um, if we move forward too quickly, we don't have the competitive piece. It, be, it ends up being more expensive for consumers. And so uh, there's no reason why I think the statute itself couldn't build in that there be competitive bidding. That may be, there may not end up, there may only be one bidder on it, but that's a process that we generally follow, that that is done well and appropriately. Uh, it encourages a lot of things, a better price, and encourages more uh, companies to get involved and as we move forward, I think, and there'll be projects large and small under the Green Communities Act, we think the competition will uh, make it a better process and, and frankly make it more cost effective. Janet?
Well, I think that's what we're in the process of doing, Jesse, if, if, you, if I'm not wrong. In other words, we're at the beginning of that process, so I've articulated a goal um, and an objective, but given the overall way in which we've approached things, we've come back to this idea that if we want to get consumers more engaged and understanding, they need to understand at the basic level what it is that bill said. I mean, it could be in Greek when it comes in, right? And people don't understand it. Um, I don't understand it, I'll be the first to say. And so we're starting with something really basic, which is what, what, are, what are the breakdown costs here? And, and you start with an idea that consumers, because we deal with consumers all, you know, uh, a lot, and they um, always grouse about bills going up, but they don't understand it. They'll grouse, rightfully so, but in other areas where people can really articulate to us a complaint or a claim, they're really not able to do that when they look at uh, an NSTAR bill or a utility bill or a national grid bill. And so starting with basics, what, what is in this bill? What are you paying for? And it gives consumers then the keys to say, well, if there are cost-effective ways for me to do my laundry at night, for instance, I will pay less money. Right now, they don't have the tools to do that. So we're, without starting with that basic building block, we're, we're already, you know, got our hands behind our back, tied behind our back. So as our folks are working with DOER and DPU with this as the goal, that's what we're still trying to figure out. We'd love to have input from folks as we go through that. I mean, it should be able to be deciphered, I think, and it should be more manageable. Uh, but, it, you know, I just you just think what, what you've grown up with and what you use, and you just take for granted you don't really know what it is. You just see the bottom line and pay it. Um, but I, I really feel at this stage, particularly if people, uh, there's less government or less effective government oversight in these areas, then consumers themselves are going to have to be more engaged in all of these matters. And that is true whether you're buying a car or you're getting a student loan or your, you know, your energy bill. So that's, that's part of our process. But love to have your input on it, frankly. <laughs> yes. I'm glad to know there's someone who knows less than I do in the room because I'm <laughs> so I'm always intimidated. Um, I think that it, the the sweetheart term is in quotes, and it is um, it's not a term of art in the energy field. Um, it it means that it, there there's a um, uh, sort of a, a a package with a bow given to a particular industry uh, or a particular company that doesn't have to compete, that also is going to, without much scrutiny, get a better return in the future uh, because there hasn't really been a competitive process or because um, the incentives and the return on the incentives are built in. Uh, in other words, uh, in our efforts to get things done, and this is true in energy and other fields, often legislation will sort of give a big incentive to someone to come into a field that ha they haven't been into before. Um, they um, limit their loss potential, they maximize their profit profitability, um, and that is, as you would with your sweetheart, um, give them advantages. Uh, we're just saying with our experience in the last five years, um, even though that may have been a good idea five years ago, there was an interest in doing that as we broke into getting people used to the idea that we had to provide incentives, now is a good time to maybe scale back on that. Um, that there should be more competition, there should be more transparency. Uh, that was part of the goal also, to get more companies engaged and involved in uh, getting involved in cost efficiency. And so uh, let's eliminate um, the practice that someone gets a pretty good deal without too much scrutiny either at the beginning and gets too much of a return on an investment without uh, having to explain why, okay? Thank you so much.